I'd like to thank the folks at Ceramics Monthly for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. As many of you know, Ceramics Monthly has been the widest circulated publication dedicated to sharing ideas, discoveries, and the best work in the ceramic arts field since 1953. Since my time as a student over 25 years ago up until today, they've been my go-to source for inspiration. I know it's going to be a good day when the newest edition of the magazine shows up in my mailbox. For a limited time, Ceramics Monthly is offering Red Clay Rambler listeners 15% off any new CM subscriptions. Now through January 31st, 2024, visit ceramicartsnetwork.org slash rambler and enter the promo code for the subscription of your choice that's listed on that page. Again, the website for that is ceramicartsnetwork.org slash rambler. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 496 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Kyung Min Park. She's going to be one of the presenters at the Florida Clay Conference, which is a three-day workshop and conference that's happening at the Morian Center for Clay in St. Petersburg, Florida. That's coming up February the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, and I am lucky enough to be going down with Kyung Min to be a part of that conference. We're going to be joined by Dita Mert and Justin Rawshank. We're going to have a great time, including a low-fire soda kiln, which Justin will be leading the firing of, as well as lectures and demos and all sorts of stuff. In our interview, we talk about how an early interest in animation led her to explore the figure, as well as how she approaches identity through the work and what it's like to settle down after moving 15 times in 18 years. She, like many artists, has done the residency circuit as well as a couple different teaching jobs. She's now an associate professor at Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts. If you'd like to see examples of her work, you can check out kyungminpark.com. As we head into the new year, we're having a comment drive for the Brickyard Podcast Network. This is one of the easiest ways you can support this show as well as our network. And you can do that by leaving a five-star rating and a review on your favorite podcast app. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And without further ado, let's get on with the interview. So let's start talking about your interest in animation and wanting to make three-dimensional figures out of clay. Growing up in South Korea, with our history, we had a Korean War, right? And then me growing up in South Korea, I remember that there were American army uh, stationed in Korea. So that growing up in like late 80s and 90s, I remember having a dedicated TV channel for American family. And then my mom knew that on Sunday, 11 a.m., they have like Sesame Street. (laughs) So she would like force me to put me in front of the TV and make me watch it, hoping that I will learn how to speak English. But I wasn't. (laughs) Um, It's so funny because later on, I came to America. And then I remember the clip of Sesame Street. That Oscar, the is it his name, the trash trash king guy. Oscar the Grouch. Yeah, he had a little like three little worms speaking to him. <laughs> and then I was mimicking the sound. I wasn't really learning how to speak. I was just like mimicking the sound of it. And then uh later on I came to America one day, I just like pulled that pick pulled that uh clip of it. 
and then how they sing it was like oh my god that's why I was so bonded to it <laughs> I don't know if you heard that song <laughs> but just type it on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> three warms <laughs> sit Sesame Street well you'll hear it but it sings like give me give me give me mud give me mud mud <laughs> but like I have no clue but uh like that I really like the shows that has a narrative with their own characters and then uh figurines that some other person created like created world I guess so I was really bonded to that idea so instead of terrifying sesame street <laughs> I also really liked clay animation because of the same reason you know some creator created the figurines to uh, have their own narrative making their own world you know that is exist but also not exist it's created imagination so I was really bonded to that idea so um, I wanted to create my own I guess my own so to say la la land I guess <laughs> um, and I remember I was fifth grade got really sick one day I just like in bed couldn't even drink the water. And I found this box of rubber clay that I just started to play with. And I was so bored. And I just start making little like figurines, tiny little ones. And then I think that was a start. I loved it. Like I can make small little figurine that looks like us. And I can like make my own story with it. Just like play with those cut out little dolls in your childhood so that's where I could be my own storyteller with creation that I created with, with my own hand so um and then I got most of my basic uh art education and training in South Korea growing up I've I was very lucky that I had very supportive parents but my mom was a musician. She's a, a professional violinist. So as growing up as an Asian child, <laughs> I played, of course, musical instrument. So I played violin ever since I was three, up until 12. Um, I knew, I think 12 years old, I, I think a lot of things happened. Like I was trying to start making a little figurine and I knew that this is what I want to do. So I told my mom that, I don't think I'm passionate in music. I wanted to go with the art. And then ever since then, like they've been very supportive and I went to art high school. And in uh, in Asia, art education system is very, uh, um, how you say, fit into the box, very skill-based. So um, I remember, like 13 years old, I fill up the whole sketchbook by just drawing lines. So very basic training, but very necessary training. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was normal for me to draw the straight line without the ruler. It's like the straight training and getting into college in South Korea, we have to have a exam. I don't think it's the same anymore nowadays, but in uh early 2000 like we get random objects to um pencil drawing or watercolor to finish start to finish in like four hours so you can tell it's like super skill based and everybody gets the same so that almost feel like they don't really ask you what kind of artist you are or what kind of work do you want to make uh, but you can draw the straight line. And then by the, like, back in the days, if I think of it, I was kind of having a hard time accepting, like, okay, skill-based work. And then I choose to be a ceramics major because I was so passionate in clay, making clay animation. And then to be able to do the clay animation, I thought that studying sculpture, especially clay, sculpture would be helpful um but then when I get to the college I noticed that 
I had to make, you know, 50 perfect mugs. <laughs> and um, from, from now on, if I think of it, that was very helpful. I get to have the basic skill that I needed to teach. So I'm very thankful for that. But you don't, never know when you're in that situation, you thought that, you know, somebody, neighbors, grass is greener. So, <laughs> but I was very lucky that uh, when I went to college in Korea, which was a year and a half, I had a professor named Carrie Boxton, who was American, who came with her husband, Brad Even Taylor, who teaches at University of Hawaii right now. Um, she came with him, so she was teaching as an adjunct at our school. And I was barely speaking English then. And then just way of her teaching was so different than um, formal education that I was getting. Like, I remember, like, her first assignment was that bring a clay outside, <laughs> right? And then get the texture, whatever you want, bring it back and make it into a box. And then you can put your narrative to it to make just small little simple cube. I was like, she's asking me to put my own thought and idea to it to make the box. I was like, oh. I don't have to fit into that box. I can create what the what goes on to the box. That was just like mind blowing. I was like, oh, finally somebody asking me what my narrative is. And then um, in South Korea, as most of clay people know, there is the um, biennial. And then I went to my first biennial, um, two thousand four. And then Song Gulya, who was my professor at University of Georgia, won the first award back in 2002. So I saw that work of like nine feet tall monumental sculpture that I'm like, what is this? <laughs> you know, I thought only thing that I can make was traditional sanggam carved, you know, pottery, because that was what I was learning most of the time. And seeing that whole figures like colorful, like droopy glazes, I'm like, this is what I want to learn. And the, ironically, the title of the piece was Alfred Summer. That's where I asked my professor Kelly, I was like, Carrie, like, what is Alfred? And she told me it's a school in uh, America that actually Brad even Taylor got his master's there. So they knew that I want to go study, so they helped me out to get here. And of course, it took me to convince my parents that I want to go study ceramics in America. That was so foreign to all my family. To be honest, they're like, what do you mean? Like, you're going to go study what and where? And I was like, yeah. And then I found my family secret that my grandma my dad's mom I remember making my perfect I thought <laughs> by that back in the days perfect you know me's you know and we make 50 you know me's and I pick, pick like six of them and I brought them home and my grandma who didn't even know how to write her name in Korean I mean that generation went through so much um she grabbed my mugs <laughs> and then instead of saying Oh my God, look at these. These are amazing. She flipped it and checked the foot and then hide up the foot and told me that you could have carved a little more on the bottom shoulder. I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it turns out my grandfather's firstborn son, who I briefly met, used to be a local ongi potter. Uh, okay. That who was asked to be a technician at one of the local college, but he said, I am not teaching anybody. I am just, uh, so to say, craftsman. So I don't think I can teach other people. But I heard that he had a lot of apprentice, uh, apprentice but he didn't see, see himself as like capable of teaching at college. Because back in the days, Potters wasn't count as towards artists. They were the craftsmen who makes 
um, what is it? Containers, you know, for daily life. So for my grand grandmother, my own grandmother, she couldn't understand what that means about me going from Korea to America to study ceramics, to make pottery that it doesn't count, even count as something, you know, more. So that was interesting thing to learn. And then if, I think only way I could convince them was that I love to teach. So I'm pursuing my teaching with the skill that I know. I think that's my way of convincing my own family. Um, so that was also good <laughs> under my own, like who, like I, growing up, I knew that like we have really nice looking ongis growing up. I mean, most of household in South Korea do have a little tiny one to keep their soy sauce, pepper paste, gochujang or kimchi underground um, during the winter time. But I know my mom had a best looking, really nice small little guys that I didn't know that was picked by my grandma. So they had, you know, the eyes to see what's good, what's bad. And then, yeah, that was brutal. Uh, first critique that I ever got <laughs> from my grandma. <laughs> well, actually, I want to talk about this because I, I think that in Korean culture, there is a, there is an idea of perfection. You see this in Korean fashion. You see this actually in the art education where you said like skill, repetition of perfection is skill. You know, but then obviously you at this point in your life, like you're making a work that is about your inner vision. So how did you can, or how long in your career did it take for your family to go, oh, right. She knows what she's doing. She has a vision. A while. <laughs> <laughs> My mom was still told me like, I think that figure, the arm should be a little bit thicker. She still mentioned something like that. I think one point I was like, you better stop now. <laughs> but that's right. I mean, I mean, in America, they're saying it like Jewish people are so into education. You know, it's the same thing. Like growing up, I remember there were a lot of high pressure. A plus is the, you know, grade that you need to get. A is average, B, they are joking to say B plus was, what was it below the average? <laughs> um, that was kind of true, like high expectation. And also as a firstborn, I think my mom trying to raise me <laughs> by the book, which I appreciated. I think that's what made me very independent. Then figure out what I want. Like if I want, if I always like set a goal and I had to get there. I think that's because how I grew up and how they raised me. And yeah, how the culture was. And it's very competitive there, I'll be honest with you. And then came to America, changed my perspective about like, oh, okay, if I really work hard, I will have opportunity. I mean, I trusted American dream when I came here. Um, everything was, I mean, I try my best. I put 200% whenever the chances came, opportunity came, I try my best. Uh, to get the best out of it. But as we all know, it was very hard past four years. And then that was the first time that I'm like, oh, right, I am not American. So uh, I think a lot of my work that I created at that time reflects that hardness about like me realizing it's um, it's tough. But also I learned through that period that like, oh, sure, I am South Korean, but also not because <laughs> I haven't lived there for 18 years. And then came here, lived 18 years. I, to some people, I still count as a foreigner, outsider. Um, so I think I looked at a lot of like how the Korean American or like Korean who were born in America, how they feel like their unique culture so it's so funny as an immigrant there are a period of time that oh yeah I'm Korean Korea was my home and then certain time after that I'm like all right I live in America America is my home 
then I'm in the weird time period, like time that I'm not sure now. Again, I'm like between her, in between her. When I turn 40, it will be half the time in South Korea and half the time, you know, in America. Yeah, it's very unique culture, and I'm going through a lot about that. So we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully this will show up in my work somehow. So you, you mentioned that it was about four years ago that you started feeling like, oh, I'm not American. So what what was it specifically? Was it the politics, the pandemic? Like, what was the shift then? I never thought, I never defined myself by the skin color beforehand. I'm just who I am. I'm Kyomin Park, girl with the hard to pronounce <laughs> name. <laughs> I thought that it's just my uniqueness from having a different background, born in a different country, came here and really trying to live and have my own story in a different country. That was how I read it. But then past four years, looking at how people get attacked because of their, like how they look, how they appear. Um, I was like, oh, that could be me. You know, so um that was a huge realization for me. I mean, I was luckily living in Boston, which has a lot of diversity. Well, I feel no way very secure in the city, but I think I had a point that I just stopped watching news. It was like really bothered me so much. And I feel lucky to have very supportive community that like if I have something happen, I could easily freely talk about it and people will come for me and tell me like, and then find me resources. And um, it was great. I mean, in a way, I also trying to find a way to like create the work that we can talk about it, like more heart to heart, like be honest, what we're going through has been there. Um, it's not like all of a sudden abruptly happened. So I think I had a lot of chance to talk. And then we all know, like we saw what people's true color is. Like down on their, you know, our skin. Can you talk about using symbols to, in just the way you've communicated with art through this period of self-realization? I have noticed some of the work is very directly about Asian identity. And it's not that the earlier work wasn't, it just wasn't so directly about Asian identity. So can you talk about that? I mean, we all evolve at some point, making work and then talking about different stories. I think I was just, like, I didn't really believe in important, like, like such work is more important than the other. Because I'm making work that reads as just like cute, like more anime related, like, you know, then the work that talks about politics or more deep down, I don't know, environmental work. Like, I never believe that some work is more way more than others before. Um, and then I was more focused on talking about my own narrative is how I started to getting into this figurative work. Like I mainly use the figures to speak my own story. Um, and then when I just came to America the first time, again, I wasn't really speaking fluently in English. So the most effective way that I could spoke was through my work through the figures that looks like us and then you can move like us have a gesture like us and then imply all those um, emotions that we can have through the work so i use that as uh, one of other form of language for me that's why i was i think the start of it was more personal stories, carry more personal stories. And I starting to notice that what's the point? <laughs> you know, if you just keep talking about your own personal story, which I have done it, can I say something different that may can affect 
more larger community. And then I found that during that four four years of going through pandemic, I mean, everybody was frustrated personally or societally, like, you know, nationally, internationally. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I guess that was a perfect time for me to switch a little bit. And artists also have a tool to talk uh, for better and larger purpose, I would say. So that's what I tried to do. What can I do to bring more larger consensus you know, among us? So I think that's where my work switched a bit. I'm not too much I guess <laughs> um I try my own way I guess then the image of the panda that I use a lot of that time was from the of course online resources um I mean online meme because people already seen it people already saw it like heard of it so it's not too foreign to them but just remind them one more time, you know. So I think that was what I was doing. There are a lot of images up online these days. People flip through phones every day for many hours, you know, getting lots of information, images, and it's very, it's not foreign for us to get it uh, exposed to other artists, other people's thought, you know. and. You pick and choose, basically. Well, drawing from memes is interesting, too, because they're almost like individual thoughts that get passed around enough that then they take on the life of their own. And you had mentioned the panda, and there's actually, in an article that Joey Quinones had written about you recently, I didn't write down exactly what you said about the panda, but essentially the panda is white and black and Asian. So it's a it's a symbol that can represent a lot of different things, but it also is just really cute. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like in terms of the ways pandas in the, in the U.S., like you'll often see panda stuffed bears, you know, like like little kid toys, and they'll hug them, and it's this idea of like comfort. So, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like using a symbol that's almost universal, but in a very specific way within the art. That's what I was trying to do with my work with using bright colors, then fun little like patterns. People see it from the distance. They normally think that, oh, it's a bright color, cute little, you know, panda, and then they walk close up to it and then they find something like why it's making screaming face, why it doesn't look happy. Um you just it's the same thing, like it just blur from from looking at it from the outside. As a big picture, it was like, oh, it's a happy story. It's just um, another animation, like another cute thing. And then you walk up to it and you found, you realize that, oh, that's not it. This figure is screaming. This figure has like uh, more emotions to it. Like, what is it? And hopefully that can bring up some thoughts and more questions that we can start talking. And a lot of time, um artists were asked to put the statement but the audience doesn't really take time to read the statement they just go straight to the work and they look at it and they decide if they like it or not and some people will stop and then read the statement i guess by making the work that is people can easily approach to it because it's it reads as a cute and colorful work but then provoking some other like there will be some other element in there like questioning like why why this is melting pandas <laughs> why there's a melting you know figures on top of each other like what is this just one bite of apple like what is this like then they will look for the statement or they will come up to me and ask me questions and we can start talking you know and you're right by using this <laughs> social media meme that they haven't seen it there. If I mentioned it, like, have you ever seen this meme? Like, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Then I already brought, you know, that uh, 
point of like, uh, what do you call it, familiar, familiarity between us that we can easily start to next instead of like, I don't know, piles of black glazed sculpture. That's, I'm just for example. <laughs> and they're already looking at it by, whoa, what is this? Then easy to approach and then start questioning and, you know, start up another new conversation. Um, that was what I've been trying to do with my work. <laughs> so I guess that carried on. There, even though you're trying to change it, there are some uh, things that you you thought that you get away from it, but it's still there. <laughs> Leaves it as um, your signature or residue, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of over 4,000 objects made by over 1,000 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Within your bigger body of work, there's different ways you approach the figure. So sometimes it's just heads, you know, it's so like the apples that have like a head face on them so that you're really focusing on this idea of like, this is the point of expression, you know, like the, the, uh, the facial expression. But then sometimes you'll have full figures, like the piece that you just had on display at the clay studio. That's a figure of yourself dressed in traditional dress with a dog that's walking with you, which we can talk about that piece later. But then there's like a third way you do it, which is to make these almost like totems of stacked heads, uh, parts of figures, parts of uh, fruit, you know, like there's all these different references. And it's three very distinctly different ways to handle the figure. So when you're making the ones that are the stacked pieces, how do you think about content in volume. So for instance, like that, there's this piece, I think, How Are You, I think was the name of that. And the top of it, this figure is like kind of reaching out, but then it's on top of this almost like psychedelic pile of color and form and glaze. So can you talk about how you approach those stacked forms? So it started with the figures. No, I got to go back all the way to in grad school. <laughs> I went to U University of Georgia to uh, earn my MFA, study under Sung Guyo and Ted Sape. I went there, went their program specifically because I wanted to learn from uh, Sung Gu, who's making figures and narrative. I thought I will, you know, learn from uh, him, which I did. And one day I remember, <laughs> it's like first year grad school, he told me not to make figures. He just like banned me from making figures. <laughs> so like I avoid my Korean education. I came to America and I get exactly what I did not I did not expect it. And then I was so lost because that's what I've been making. That was my main tool. And then he's asking me to use different tool to speak myself. And I didn't know what to do. My midterm was coming. I just brought a bag of clay outside and just start making something without thinking much, which is so opposite of making figures because it it's the form that people are so used to. And if you are making eyes too big or arms too long, people notice it right away. So there will be a lot of thought out there and plans. Then. I all of a sudden didn't have, like, I had no idea what I'm creating. I didn't know what I'm making. So I'm started, starting to making this morphous form. And then after seeing different forms that just floating into my space in my graduate school, just like that is so total opposite of what I'm doing. And I was just interested in how, what if I combine those two? So it's like coming from Morpheus, don't know what it is. It's almost like creating 
thought bubbles into the figures that looks like us, tells like main stories to it. And I use that blank thought bubble to talk about like environment, like surroundings of that situation. So I've been using that form ever since then. And then when I asked to be in the figuring space uh, for the clay studio last year, I, and they specifically asked all the artists to make life-size figure. And I thought this might be a great time for me to create a work that will be larger scale. So larger, like scale-wise, larger scale can have more details, more surface to decorate. Um, and it became more monumental than the pedestal piece. And I was always seeing my piece to grow up a little bit bigger and then scale-wise and wanted to compare like what it does to it. The work that I was usually making that is pedestal size worked out good because as we briefly talked about it, my work carries that little cuteness, easy to approach when it's smaller scale than the human figure itself. I mean, smaller than life size. It's easier to approach to do what I uh, wanted to do. But then when the scale got bigger, more monumental, that was also a good chance for me to see how people react differently. It was the same element that I used in smaller like scale figure, just blew up the size. Then I didn't go to opening, so I didn't really see, but I saw a lot of pictures how people like reach to the figure that the figure itself on top was almost eye level to the view viewers. So they get really like go close to it and then like pointing at them where she's like reaching out to like eye level. And then it follow the eyes, like how they see it is like follows down because they will go to the what it, whatever it, that is most familiar to them. And then the gauge goes down to read, you know, the work top to bottom most of the time. And then they will see that was basically all the work that I created past four years combined. So that little apple figures that I use in the uh, figures speaking to her or under underneath of the figure um, has dual meanings. Apple in Korean is called sagwa. But sagwa also means apology. I was just like feeling that's how I felt. Feeling sorry, you know, saying I'm so sorry more often. I think that four years. I'm sorry that this is happening to us. I'm sorry this has happened to you. I'm sorry, you know, like, so I used the image of Apple a lot that time. So that was what went on to that figure. And of course, I use that morphous form that I've been using to that figure. And then the bottom uh, of the figure was stacked up to figures that was a melting to each other. Um, that were a figure called Meltdown. <laughs> so it's like everybody's boiled and melting it down, you know. <laughs> so that's how I felt. So it's like really honest feeling of what we've been all through. And I know people can relate it to kind of feeling... So that was the whole element um, that I put it into that work. And it was very interesting for me to see how scale can change how viewers see the work and their interaction. Not that I think that anything is so different. You know, I, um, but it was interesting practice for me, myself. I mean, I work and live in the same place. Um, so I live currently living in Boston and I live in the place called Midway Artist Studio. So this is artists like live and work place. Um, and the city of Boston is expensive <laughs> to live. And I probably, if I had a kiln at home, it would be too much money to fire. 
So luckily I'm like, uh, have my own kyung at school and fire there. But that means I have to create a piece that is 25, 26 inches tall because that's the highest height that, you know, you can fit into the electric kyung. But I have to create the work. And then before it completely dries out, I have to put it in the car and drive 40 minutes to school and put it in the kyung and get it out, bring it back to glaze it and bring it back again. Oh, my God. Yeah. Thanks to my husband. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> <It's right. laughs> so that was challenging. Uh, but yeah, that was really good uh, practice for me as well. Um, maybe I can talk a little bit more about um, the transition here that I was at Aramont uh, last July to teach a workshop for two weeks with Taylor Robina. Um, and then um, do you remember there were uh, also another uh, short term, what's it called? Not a conference. Uh, a surface that that was called. What was it called? Oh yeah, it's now called Pentaculum. But before yeah, that, yeah. it was called Surface Something. I know what you're talking about. At Aramont. So I was there right after grad school. I believe so. That was the time that I create my first piece. Not the first piece, but like first round of the piece that has morphous form and figures on top. And then going back <laughs> after 10 plus year, and I was like, oh my God, I'm making the same work. <laughs> that was good realization that I'm like, I think this might be the time for me to move on and explore something a little different. Let's explore this. So did you feel like that? Because obviously in those 10 years, you'd progressed a ton. Like the the work, you were having a full circle moment, but it wasn't like you stayed at the same point on the circle for 10 years. Like you were doing a lot of different things. So was the sense that you're not taking big enough risks and that that is why you want to change? Or what, what was the sense you had when you had the full circle moment? Well, you're right. My work evolved you know, like technically, probably, like my figure looks more, I guess I was finding more details in my figurative work, like let's technically explore many different things, um, but I stayed in the same theme, I guess. I was still trying to dig in like what I'm trying to say with my work and just gaining the experiences can I do this? You know, can I be part of this community? Like, can I like survive as an artist? That's another thing. So yes, past 10 years, besides making work, I think it was more like exploration as an artist. Is this right path? Is this right thing to do? Can I survive? Yes, we talked about it earlier, but I did move... 15 times past 18 years lived in the six different states I just if there were a chance I would just go for it I didn't have a family lived in America I didn't have stationed place to go so I could just go anywhere I just have to pack up and just move so I think that helped me to became who I am now and then I learned so much from going here one place to other place. If I would have stayed in one place, probably I was I will learn something from that one place. But I think because I moved around so much that I met so many different people, not just an artist, you know, in general. And I have so many stories to tell. <laughs> I see different part of America. So that really made me who I am. It's interesting. Like joking, you told my mom that I was born in Asia, grew up, you know, until 20 years old. And I moved to a whole different country. And in that country, even so, I moved around so many times. And I think I was trying to immerse myself into so many different situations, so many different cultural aspects. And then even going to like Europe, explore their cultures or 
um, different part of Asia. I mean, I travel, like traveling is also another way to, for me to like gaining the information, gaining some ideas. Yeah, I think I'm branching out from like speaking about my own story to my surroundings, my environment, to other people's story or outside of how they look us or how do they look at me. So we're keep learning, right? <laughs> you you mentioned that you want to move away from the figure, that that was one of the things that you felt like, okay, I've done this. I've said what I want to say. So what are you working on now in the studio? Good call. <laughs> <laughs> I was just sit down and doing a lot of idea sketches if I can reveal a couple things that like uh, I just had us made uh, an apple inside of the plastic bag and hang it in my studio um, I've been making that and I'm going to move on to next one but like I was more questioning broader questions like what we see is what are we really seeing or what values more like does that really mean anything I think deeper down under like the question that I had as a human, I mean, I want to always read more or talk to people who's not an artist, like what people going through, what they're questioning and like what, what they believe. I think that I'm more interested in that, those now, not just me, myself, or like, but asking others what they're going through. I want to learn from other people. So I've been just writing down like if I come up with some idea, I will, you know, write it down, like what it is and talking to friends. I mean, my apartment, as I said, there's a ton of other artists. So if I just like go knock on the door and like everybody will be like open to talk. Lovely. Like I, we just, you know, meet up in the hallway and then talk. Yeah. Like there's photographer, graphic designers, like poem, like um, dancers, like so it's yeah it's a very unique environment that I'm in um so next phase I think I want to learn from others I want to hear in, instead of I was speaking about what my thought what I felt I want to listen sit back and listen um so I think this also impact a lot by my teaching philosophy I guess <laughs> um I am teaching at a college, the four years liberal art college. So majority of my students are non-art majors. So I am back and dealing with people who doesn't understand, they couldn't understand what artists really do and means. They're not just craftsmen, you know, what we do is not what you really think. <laughs> so. I got a lot of questions from my colleagues that like, why are you here? <laughs> or why don't you apply for bigger art school? Um, but I found that it's more meaningful for me to let people know what I do or what we do as an artist and how hard it is, how challenging it is. We're not just sit back and doing, they think that hobby. <laughs> But this is very serious. Um, I think that's why, even though I got a teaching job, I try to be very active in my field and so that I can set up an example to show them as by doing it so that this is a serious like career. My goal is that after one semester, the students who's like finance majors or hospitality major come in saying this was the hardest course that I ever <laughs> <took>. <laughs> this semester and actually they do talk a lot about it like I cannot fake it I cannot use chat GPT to generate work so I have to actually come in and put you know time and effort to finish this assignment Professor Park I didn't know this will take this long just making one cup but it's so hard. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's what I want. So next time when you go out and, um, you know, go to the farmer's market and then you walk by the stand 
my ceramic artist and you pick up the cup and look at the price and you're like mug for $45 you know instead of that you can be like oh my gosh she put so much time on to decorate this just educate you know just people normal people to understand what we do I think it's more meaningful and that's actually better for our field I feel like there were so many great educators out there we just talked about Kim Dickey, you know, <laughs> um, to create more better artists. I believe there's so many great artists who can help to create better artists out there. I think in our field, we need to convince normal people, educate people out there who can understand, like who really will understand better about what we do is not just our hobby it needs dedication it needs really so much time and effort to put in to get that skill I was ended up and and my final critique would you're not just collecting an object for $45 you're actually paying for that artist dedication and time and effort they put it in to acquire that skill level and they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> then you give them the aha moment where they do put it together. <laughs> well, that's my goal for Ceramics 101. I mean, yes, i be honest with you. I, If I get like one or two like students who go to grad school, I feel very lucky. Um, and then sometimes I question it. What if I was teaching a bigger art college, you know, help them out more professional way? I question it, but... I think for now, I'm very happy about where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if I can make people to change how they view a little bit, um, I think that's meaningful for me. Uh, so yeah, I think that's also taught me to listen and, you know, and really hear what they think of artists, what art means to them. And of course, art students will say, this is all, this is what I like, this is my, you know, dream comes true. But like, what is finest major student will tell me about making cup? Most of the students will come in like, oh, I took ceramic courses in high school. I liked it as my hobby, so I'm doing this. They're taking it as like art aesthetic course. Um, artist art awareness but then do you really aware <laughs> around you know what art means so yeah I mean that's what I'm trying to do in my small setting so yeah and then they taught me how to be so patient <laughs> <laughs> and listen so I think yeah that's why I, I think next phase of my storytelling would be listening start with listening and um, see what's around me and around us. So I'm not sure. I don't really have like uh, specific sketches that what I'm going to do. And who knows, maybe in two years, I'll go back to figures. Uh, <laughs> but for now, I think this is the time for me to like change the gear and see what else I can do. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Uh, I did want to end talking about uh, the Florida Clay Conference, which we're both going to be at, which is in February. So I hope people will come down and visit us. Um, that's going to be the end of February in, in St. Pete at the Morian, clay, Morian Center for Clay. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you there. That will be amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, when I saw the list of artists, I'm like, oh, wow, this will be very interesting. Line up. And most of you guys are going to be functional potters. So I was like, oh, there will be a lot to learn, <laughs> <laughs> even for myself. So I'm very excited. And hopefully many people will join us for three days workshop. There are a lot of things to learn and uh, speak with. So everybody come and join us. To wrap up, can you plug uh, your social media and website so people can find out more? My website is www.kyungmin.park.com. 
It's a little long. <laughs> <laughs> if you Google KP Ceramics, it will pop up too. Um, social media is same thing. K Y U N G M I N. Uh, park nine to nine. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Ben, for having me today. Was- oh, for sure. It's been a pleasure. I'm excited to see you in person in February. I'll see you then. <laughs> I'd like to thank Kyung Min for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with her and to learn more about her work. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors, the first of which is Ceramics Monthly. From now until the end of January, they are offering Red Clay Rambler listeners 15% off any new Ceramics Monthly subscriptions. To take advantage of that, go to ceramicartsnetwork.org rambler. Also wanted to thank the Archie Bray Foundation, who is our parent organization as well as the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in sponsoring an episode of this show, you can get in touch through our website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.